Welcome to Trinity Online. I am the Reverend Adrian Cook, Priest Associate at Trinity Cathedral in Cleveland, Ohio. And I welcome you to this morning service of Holy Eucharist, Rite 2. If you'd like to follow along, you can download the bulletin at trinitycleveland.org on our homepage. And today I'm joined by the very Reverend B.J. Owens, the Dean of the Cathedral, who will be our preacher. I invite you to please join me in the opening hymn, number 135.
Blessed are you, holy and living one. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on a sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said would, he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Oh. 
A reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they were not dealing with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Live in the world as though not, for the present form of the world is passing away. My aunt tells a story of her church youth group when she was in middle school. This would have been about the early 1960s, and she was at Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Southern Pines, North Carolina. The topic of the event was nuclear war. The question that the youth group leader posed to the young people was this, if the Soviet Union had launched a nuclear attack first, and we knew that the missiles were on their way, what were we supposed to do? Remember now, this is the early 60s. The Cold War was raging, and nuclear annihilation was a constant fear. What would be the Christian response to this unwinnable situation? 
As she tells the story, the consensus of the group was actually quite clear. We should launch a counter-strike. Now, these were middle schoolers, so I'm not sure how far they got into the weeds of uh, strategies of containment or deterrence, though I'm sure it came up. What I suspect is that there was a sense of fatality and not knowing what to do. And so if someone had signed your death warrant, then there's really nothing to be done about it except to give a little bit of payback. The profound complexity of nuclear weapons was boiled down in that moment to rules of engagement that could have been borrowed from the schoolyard. If you get hit, you hit back. Ignoring both the devastation that would unleash, but also the Christian imperative to turn the other cheek, even at risk of losing one's own life. Now, my aunt spoke up in the moment, saying that if we're going to die anyway, then love of neighbor means not firing back. The youth group leader spoke up then, and I'm, I'm guessing must have shocked the group by saying that that is the Christian response, that in fact that is the right answer if we're going to consider faithfully how to live in a nuclear age. Perhaps what is lost most in the telling these many decades later is not just the tragedy of the situation, the absurdity of it, that we as a civilization had reached a point in history where we had effectively claimed for ourselves the ability to annihilate the world in an instant. Perhaps what is most lost in the time since is just how much that fearful but forgotten reality has warped us and seeped into our DNA where it has quietly chipped away at our capacity to love our neighbor. St. Paul writes to the Ephesians that the present form of the world is passing away. Now, there are two parts to he here that teach us something really important about how to follow Christ at this moment in history. The first part is the present form of the world, which is, already has a certain transient quality, doesn't it? The present form of the world implies that what we see now is only what we see now, that there was something before and that there will be something after it. 2,000 years before we started saying, well, you know, it is what it is. 2,000 years before we started using that phrase all the time, Paul rendered it completely asinine in the view, in the eyes of God, simply by using the word, the present form of the world, to talk about the here and now. The present form of the world. And here's the second part is passing away. We live in the world, but we must somehow live apart from it with eyes towards the world that God imagines for us all. But let's spend some time with the present form of the world, the world that we live in now, the world that, that wants us to believe that there's no other way. And we may even look back to the early 1960s as, as distant and ancient history, but of course it isn't. In my 45 years, we've spent less time obsessing over the nuclear threat, yet we still live in the same dispensation, only differently. The danger is still there, even if we're much quieter about it. The present form of the world is one in which technology comes before humanity where efficacy and efficiency triumph over ethics. Consider medicine, where we can keep our bodies alive for so much longer, yet if we don't do the sole work of reckoning with our mortality, then we have no way of saying when enough is enough. Consider the communications technology that amplify our voices, yet absolve us of our accountability to one another. And yes, consider weapons, from chemical weapons to drones to nuclear warheads that allow us to project power and devastation on any human being on the planet in the name of security.
our faith tells us that the present form of the world is passing away. This calls us to a place of great spiritual maturity and growth. Yet what is our response? When the world is changing, do we grip more tightly or do we open our hearts? Do we find a way to release our grasp on the things of this world, especially those things that we happen to like? Or do we clench even harder to those things so that we're never forced to change? That's the question for this day. And beneath the pressing issue of nuclear weapons, in fact, the presenting issue of nuclear weapons, that was the same deeper question for us at the advent of the nuclear age. And how did we respond? How did we live amid this terrifying reality that life could end in an instant? We built a fortress. We assembled an arsenal so big that no one would challenge it, knowing full well that if someone actually did, the whole house would come crumbling down. We practiced forgetfulness out of necessity, yet decades of fear took its toll and seeped into our unconscious. And then we got really good at it. We got really good at forgetfulness, building engines of prosperity, all while forgetting the selective nature of those engines. We built suburbs. We put our trust in mortgages. And we built a world that will never pass away. Because that was the only way that we would sleep soundly in the nuclear world that was our deeper reality. The price of that world. What we gave up in that blissful forgetting was the capacity to see and to know that this present world is passing away as well. Because that is a reality that goes even deeper than nuclear weapons. It is a soul truth that Paul taught the earliest Christians, and it applies to every era. This world is changing, and either we cling to it more tightly or we find a way to leave our treasures and follow Jesus. Fortunately, though, not everyone has forgotten. This week was a momentous one in the quest to dismantle the world's stock of nuclear weapons. As an anti-nuclear an anti treaty signed by more than 50 nations went into effect, the United States is quite prominently not among those nations. Yet, as of Friday, two days ago, the transport or deployment or creation of nuclear weapons is now in violation of international law. This treaty is the work of the International Committee to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, and it earned them the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. For this week's Trinity Forum, I spoke with Dr. Emily Welty. It, it appeared just before this service, but of course, because you can download all things at all times, it's available to you now, and I hope you'll watch it after the service if you haven't. Dr. Welty is a professor of religion and a member of ICANN. Dr. Welty and her organization were ordered, ordered, were given, awarded the Peace Prize for their work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and for their groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons. The present form of this world is passing away, and that can be very good news. I'm so grateful to visionaries who work to dismantle a world where our only option is to retreat behind more lethal fortresses, to follow Jesus, is to share that vision and to work to bring it to fruition. Now, I cannot imagine that Paul envisioned nuclear weapons. I can't imagine that Paul envisioned chemical weapons either. And for that matter, I can't imagine that Paul envisioned intensive care units, Twitter, or even washing machines. But what he did speak of can help us navigate our own era, a time that is so often anxious and uncertain and without boundaries. The reality is this. 
And it is always this. The present form of the world is passing away. What we see and know today is always fading. It is always giving way to the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And at every moment, we can either embrace that or we can run to fortify and solidify what we already know. At every moment. Now, Paul, of course, is speaking at what he thinks is the almost end times. So a little perspective helps here. But note that in speaking of the contingency of the moment, Paul neither says abandon it all, nor does he say it is what it is, so just live your lives. We do live in this world. We do have a responsibility to one another. We have been given this time to grow in faith, so let's not waste it. Yet we live in this world as though not. As though the things that we treasure and cling to are little more than artifacts of a world that is passing away. As though the life and wholeness of people who live on another continent is actually more important than our own safety and prosperity. We live as though hatred and supremacy were pathological aberrations and not simply the way that things are. Most of us don't have a nuclear weapons arsenal at our disposal, but each of us, besides speaking up in witness, must do the sole work of living, learning to live in a world that is passing away, choosing faith over fortifications and belovedness over barriers. If we cannot change in our own lives, if we have no capacity to leave our nets and our places of comfort and sometimes even our families to follow Jesus, then our calls to dismantle and change and reconcile are going to ring hollow. And we will remain stuck with few ideas other than to build the walls even higher. The world is passing away. So what do we choose? Do we rush to amplify and firm up what we already have? I wonder how much that is our hidden motivation. And I wonder how much of that has been unconsciously shaped by generations now of living in a world where deep down we knew it could be wiped out in an instant. I feel like most of the distortions in our world today trace back to this. But you know, I don't have to wonder how much pain that causes. Or do we take control of our powerlessness by letting the world pass away so that we can live for the new thing that God is doing? Can we uncling and unclutchify long enough to realize that what we're holding on to is temporary and never actually belong to us anyway? Now, I'm always struck by the simple beauty of Peter and Andrew, seeing Jesus for the first time, then leaving their fishing boats, even leaving their father standing there, as bittersweet as that is, there's a beauty to walking and following Jesus the minute you meet him. Now, it was boneheaded, but it was also courageous, and it was beautiful. And then they spent the next three years getting summarily worse at it. The gospel seems to be about stories where they forget how to follow. Instead, they want to build shelters around every spot where Jesus does something cool. It's like the disciples peaked at the very first moment they met Jesus. But the point wasn't them getting good at it. The point was simply that they followed They were still in the world, but in a way their hearts had taken them onto a different path within that world, one that pointed to the eternal presence and infinite love of God. As the present form of the world passes away, we can run to the barricades to protect what we love. We can always do that. Or we can step out of the boat and follow Jesus into the mystery. What we do in this moment has everything to do with how we live in the world, 
how we love our neighbor, how we dismantle racism, how we build the church and proclaim the body of Christ, how we care for the earth, and yes, how we envision and build a world free of nuclear weapons that threaten our lives and distort our very souls. <sighs> nuclear weapons. It is what it is, right? My friends, it is not and has never been and will never be what it is. No, the present form of the world, this present form of the world is passing away. And what is coming into being is infinitely holy and knows nothing of such terrifying weapons of war. Amen. Let us profess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. You who by the leading of a star guided the Magi to the brightness of the Holy Child of Bethlehem, lead us to the light of revelation, that we may value and honor the varied gifts of your children. Christ be our light, shine in our hearts. You who framed the brightness of the first light in creation, Dispel the arrogance, animosity, and anger that shatter the unity of our world and of your holy church. Fill your people with the radiant light of truth. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts. You who delivered your people from the misery of bondage and slavery to the land of promise, set us free from enslavement to division, disunity, and distrust in our public life and labor. Illumine those in authority with the light of vision. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts. You who patterned the stars and called the sun into being, who appointed the moon and chartered the cosmos, pattern the hearts of people everywhere to see in each other the beauty of your creation, that divisions of race, class, gender, sex, and nationality may be recreated into one common humanity. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts. You who shower comfort and hope to the lowest and least, shower your light of compassion on those who are sick, on those who sorrow, and on those who suffer. Help us to be your compassion and hope in the world as we pray for the needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Bob, Gigi, Dale, Melody, Priscilla, Meredith, Lori, George, Lois, Kermie, David, and the Salazar family. We pray for our companions in the Diocese of Belize and the Diocese of Tanga, Tanzania 
In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we continue to pray for the bishops of Ohio, retired and present. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the churches in the Diocese of Alabama. We pray for our congregational ministries and the volunteers who give their time to the Greater Cleveland Congregation's ministry. We pray for U.S. military personnel and for their families. We pray for loved ones who have recently died, especially Kate Lunsford. We pray for those who have died from COVID-19 and for their families. Shine the light of hope. Christ be our light. Shine in our hearts. You who welcome those who have died into the brilliant light of eternity, welcome with open arms those whose lives have been lost to COVID-19 and especially for those who have died alone. We pray for those whose lives have been cut short from violence and warfare. Shine the light of peace in your world. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts. We offer blessings upon those celebrating birthdays this week. Sandra Abukir, Anna Day, May Pelster, Melissa Segoy, George Ronda, Doreen Hughes, Kevin Oster, Catherine Spilsbury, Valerie Kosanovich, Thomas Reuter, Charlotte Nichols, Uma Boyle, Bowl, Mike Morales, Grace Moritz, and Peggy Price. You who delight in this complexity and splendor of creation, help us to delight in the diversity of this earth, our island home. Inspire your people to care for this earth and all you have made. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. May Christ, the morning star who knows no setting, find us ever burning with the light of love, the spirit of truth, and the wellspring of hope. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Peace be with you. Good morning once again and welcome to Trinity Cathedral. It's a pleasure to have you with us, have a, you with us this morning. I want to thank Dr. Emily Welty for joining me for the Trinity Forum. It aired at 10 a.m. this morning, but of course it's available online and you can watch it now if you haven't had a chance to. And I really want to thank her and celebrate the work of the International Committee of, to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. That's something that our Episcopal Peace Fellowship has been following for some time, and I'm grateful for their ministry as well. I ask that you, yes, that you continue to work and pray for the abolition of nuclear weapons as we continue to build a community that reflects what God wants us to be. I also want to remind you that our diocesan convocation is still happening this year. And instead of having an event where everyone from the diocese is invited to come together for workshops and, and, liturg and, and worship and fun time together, uh, we can't do that, of course. So what we'll be doing between February 7th and 14th is having evening sessions that you can participate via the usual Zoom <laughs> channels. Uh, and we'd love it if you participate in that. That might be a great way if stepping away for a day, a day and a half in February is too much for you. 
Uh, this is a year where you can just dip your toe in and try a couple of things that are on offer. So if you want to know more about that, you can follow uh, our, our, um, our e-news or you can ask me or Ginger or any member of the staff about it. We'd love to have you. I'd love to have people from Trinity joining our, our colleagues from around the diocese uh, for this important part of our life together. I want to uh, remind you, of course, that you can continue to give online. Uh, though we can't pass, pass a basket, the, there is a link on the website right by where the bulletin is, uh, where you can simply make a donation, as you would uh, on a regular Sunday morning. And I also want to welcome you, if you're new to Trinity, to the life of this cathedral congregation. If you'd like to know more about Trinity or to get involved, uh, just let me know. Let Ginger Bittacofer know. Uh, so that we can get you connected. We're, as, as challenging as this is, being distant from one another, we celebrate that we still have people coming to Trinity for the first time and getting involved in the life of the community. Uh, and we celebrate your presence. We celebrate this whole wider congregation of people joining us from wherever they meet, might be this morning. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation, your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing.
glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor. Glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. As I receive the elements on behalf of the congregation, I invite you to pray the prayer for spiritual communion at home. O Lamb of God, in union with the faithful at every altar of your church, my heart offers you praise and thanksgiving. I love you above all things, and I earnestly desire to receive you into my soul. And although I cannot receive you sacramentally, I invite you into my heart spiritually. May my soul be fed by this spiritual food, and may my heart know you more dearly in the breaking of this bread. Amen. Please join me in the post-communion prayer that can be found in your bulletin. Lord of the feast, we thank you for gathering us as your people. We call to remembrance the many times we have been fed at your table, and we lament our distance now. 
Be present, Lord Jesus, as you were present with your disciples. Be known to us in the breaking of the bread. And may your Holy Spirit sustain us and all your church until we can all gather together again. We ask this for the sake of your love. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May the light of the Holy Spirit shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the face of Christ turn towards you and give you peace. Amen. Please join me in the closing hymn, Lord of the Dance.
Time.